All right, everybody, can we sit down? So welcome back. Um, I hope you are refreshed and ready for another session. So after having a good discussion about the various challenges that we, we face in um, addressing NCDs in humanitarian settings, we're now going to look at some of the examples of where those we've tried to address those challenges. And so we have a number of speakers who are going to give us some examples from some different settings. Um, but to start off, we'll, we'll have looking again a bit at the evidence that exists. So we're going to have um, Bayard and Pablo who will talk to us about um, a systematic review that they've done on the effectiveness of NCD invention, uh, interventions as well as the integration of HIV and NCDs. So Bayard, who you've already met, um, who's the director of EcoHost um, and has done a lot of research on settings in fragile and conflict states based on looking at NCDs, mental health um, and harmful behaviours. Um, and Pablo Perel, who's also a colleague at the London School of uh, Tropical Medicine and Hygiene and a cardiologist. So, Thank you, Philippa. So uh, me and Pablo are just going to uh, share this, uh, this presentation, and I sh should hopefully be fairly quick, uh, partly because there isn't actually much to say on this topic. Um, <laughs> So this is, uh, so I'm going to present today uh, the findings from this study that Pablo and I and uh, Carl and others were involved with. Uh, and this is looking specifically at NCDs uh, and the effectiveness of interventions for NCDs in humanitarian crises. And this was part of a broader study uh, that I led with Carl Blanchet here uh, that was funded by DFID and the Wellcome Trust, uh, looking at the evidence on all public health interventions in humanitarian uh, crises. Uh, a fairly thankless task, too. So the NCD one was a bit easier because uh, there wasn't really very much. Uh, so the aim of it uh, is given here, and it, we really followed standard uh, systematic review methodology, a wide range of bibliographic <coughs> databases, including grey literature. It was quantitative only. It's humanitarian crisis, so both uh, complex emergencies, complex as well as uh, natural disasters. Uh, we only looked at low- and middle-income countries. Uh, and we went back as far as 1980, and we did a quality assessment as well. So we retrieved over 6,000 studies specifically uh, in our search for NCDs. We came up with eight. So kind of good news for us, uh, bad news for, for everyone else. Um, just to put it in a broader context, uh, these are the results that we found for health interventions for other health topics. So <coughs> very predictably, uh, many more for communicable disease, nutrition, even mental health and psychosocial support. Um, far less for sexual and reproductive health and water and sanitation. So NCDs is really parked firmly in the lower end of that. Um, but overall, actually not that much evidence globally on all these topics. And, and so what were the, the study findings? So First of all, there was only, when we're thinking about effectiveness, ideally we would like to have some kind of control trial, uh, or at least use of controls. And there was only one randomized control trial uh, that we found, and that was on the use of traditional medicine um, for Tibetan refugees in India. And then the vast majority were, well, we had a case series, uh, interrupted time series analysis, part of really a cohort, and then the rest were cohort studies, which are really prospective use of surveillance data. Um, and uh, main outcomes were diabetes, heart failure, hypertension, and so on. Uh, and the vast majority of studies were from the Middle East, um, with six studies predictably given the, the burden of disease in the region. Uh, importantly, four of these eight studies uh, came from one uh, group of authors, and it was one population. Uh, and the lead author is uh, here, Dr. Kader. So uh, essentially, we should be grateful to you for providing half of the global evidence uh, <laughs> on the effectiveness of NCD intervention. So uh, thank you for that. And, and the results, partic particularly from, from your work, uh, is that often the, the, in terms of clinical outcomes, uh, it's not great, um, particularly for diabetes, perhaps slightly better for, for hypertension. Um, and there were problems in terms of just uh, receiving proper checks and screening and so on. So we have problems there. Um, but importantly, what, what these studies also showed was really the value and the, the feasibility of being able to do uh, prospective digital surveillance systems and, and the importance of setting up these kind of systems. And this was with Palestinian refugees in Jordan. Um, 
And uh, the other, the study, these and other studies amongst these eight also showed the value of disease management protocols and the value of algorithm-based interventions. But there are always buts. Um, so the strength and quality of the evidence was generally limited, um, particularly on those that uh, some of the other four studies. So the outcome reporting was weak. Uh, the sort of diagnostic criteria were not always very clear. Uh, there is this reliance on observational study designs rather than uh, more experimental study designs, including <coughs> limited use of control groups. There were a number of biases that were picked up in the quality reporting related to sort of missing data, problems with inadequate patient follow-up, and also uh, <coughs> limited ability to address confounding. Um, and st uh, things that none of the studies addressed were issues around the costs and feasibility of, of these interventions. And this was brought up in the first session this morning. And I, I think it, it's, we know that the cost of NCDs can be prohibited treatment for NCDs can be extremely expensive, particularly uh, the complications from NCDs. Um, but we really are lacking an evidence base to prove what is feasible, what uh, is cost-friendly um, cost and even cost-effective. Um, we also didn't find studies on integrating care, for example, with mental health uh, or HIV and TB. And, and this is a, there's certainly a lot of interest in this, and, and Pablo is going to be talking about this sort of more globally in the, in the next presentation. Um, and also there were no studies on, on the effectiveness of, of health promotion, and this is a, a, an issue that was raised this morning. And clearly and very understandably, the, the focus has been on treatment um, for many obvious reasons, but it, it's something, I think, to pick up. There are obviously a number of limitations with the, this review. Uh, it was descriptive analysis only, but uh, trying to do a meta-analysis on eight studies uh, would seem fairly futile, particularly given the varied outcomes uh, and study designs. We only went back to 1980. Uh, in reality, the first study I think we found was from something like 1997. Um, uh, we only looked at quantitative studies because it was effectiveness. And potentially we did include gray literature, but we didn't approach agencies directly for that or seek reports they may hold, hold privately. So there may possibly be added literature on that. Um, and I'm just very briefly going to go slightly off topic and back into this issue of prevention. Uh, in other reviews that uh, we've been involved with, um, they also show a fairly negligible evidence base. And so the topic of alcohol was mentioned, mentioned earlier. There's potential risks for alcohol misuse and uh, harmful alcohol use amongst conflict-affected populations, particularly related to exposure to traumatic events and violence, uh, impoverishment, uh, lack of opportunities, uh, and so on, which could uh, lead to harmful alcohol use. All of those are also known risk factors for uh, a range of mental disorders, and there's evidence of strong evidence of comorbidity between me uh, mental disorders and harmful alcohol use. And clearly, all of these, there's evidence separately of, of uh, the links with non communicable disease, as well as other key issues in these populations, such as gender based violence. And so, I think alcohol is, is a really critically, for me, is a critically neglected issue, and it's something that we tried to sort of raised discussion on, uh, not to much effect really. Um, and there's also no evidence around sort of effectiveness of interventions for alcohol. And these studies, by the way, are not for alcohol and tobacco, are not just around effectiveness, they're for everything. So it's about the burden of uh, harmful alcohol use, access to services and so on. So the evidence is really fairly negligible on alcohol. Uh, it does suggest there is some link between conflict exposure and forced displacement with harmful alcohol use. And it's a similar pattern with tobacco. Um, and particularly conflict exposure with nicotine dependence. And so, it, while fully, fully appreciate and acknowledging the complexity of addressing NCDs in these settings and the question marks over the feasibility in, uh, of being able to address prevention activities, uh, it is something I think to bear in mind, particularly given that in more stable settings and long term forced displacement <coughs> settings where it's whatever the average is now, 17 plus years for refugees. These are potentially situations where more meaningful uh, activities could take place for NCD prevention activities, particularly around alcohol, and, uh, particularly around alcohol, um, and the ability to also measure the effectiveness of those interventions. So these are, are the key messages. Predictably, uh, fairly few things more irritating than an academic saying we need more data, but I think it is valid. Uh, and uh, also the the value of looking at electronic surveillance systems. Um, 
need for more studies, better studies, stronger study designs. Uh, and this is certainly something that we're going to explore in the session this afternoon, the potential and the, f of the, and the feasibility of, of these types of study designs in these clearly challenging settings. And I think we'll say more studies on looking at economic methods, cost effectiveness, and so on. So thank you very much. I'll hand over to Pablo now. Thank you. Questions or clarification for Bayard before we move on to Pablo? Anything from the audience? No? Yes. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was very good. Uh, my question is. Uh, What's the plan for the future then? I mean, there's massive gap in terms of research, that's clear, uh, particularly for alcohol, tobacco, possible substance misuse, which is not addressed, addressed completely, but it's a problem. So what do you think, uh, what will happen in the coming years? Thank you. Yeah, I've <laughs> no, I've no <laughs> idea, really. Uh, it's it's uh, absolutely something that we would like to I mean, we're actively seeking to do more work on it. And I think, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the work that we're doing with MSF and the thinking behind this symposium today is how we can do more work uh, in improving the evidence base behind work on uh, NCDs and particularly the effectiveness of interventions. And, and hopefully that would also extend into to prevention activities as well. So this, we'll just stick to questions of clarification for now. If, if it's that, yes, but otherwise, yeah, please. Uh, the, the microphone. Uh, I think we no, we'll I just think wait we for the it. microphone. We just have an online audience, so we need to uh, make sure they can hear. Uh, thanks. Andy Seal from uh, UCL. Just wondering if you'd come across any studies on obesity prevention or control in emergency affected um, populations, because it's quite surprising. I was a little bit surprised so far that the word obesity hasn't even been come up, malnutrition mentioned once, yeah. but of course many populations are affected by the double burdens of malnutrition. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, I don't. this study wouldn't have picked up on obesity as an outcome because we were looking at NCD outcomes rather than uh, sort of risk factors behind these NCD outcomes. So the systematic review <coughs> here wouldn't have picked up on it. And it may be a similar story with the, this, the presentation given by James this morning and the review we've been working on there. But uh, definitely within that, there have been some studies on obesity and this, this double burden of disease. Um, so I think there was one from uh, Saharan refugees. Um, and so that it has come up, uh, absolutely, and I think there will be more. But we haven't explicitly looked for that. But I, I think it's a very valid point. I think more work could be done, done on that and examining the existing evidence base for it, yeah. Thanks. Um, just a question regarding the environment where the settings, as I mentioned, uh, the systematic review, if I recall, I mean, uh, was bringing together all the intervention and under a broad umbrella of humanitarian settings. Uh, like most of the studies of Ali are more in a protected situation yeah. of refugee and displaced population, which are more similar to a kind of normal stable situation yeah. rather than really acute emergencies. To what extent, at least in the future, we can make that distinction because of case, of course, pulling all together that information. For me, interventions in humanitarian settings, when you have UNRWA interventions, of course, I mean, they are dealing with vulnerable population. It's not to the same extent of having yeah. more acute emergencies where actually the, the operational model are totally different, yeah. the choices that are made also different. Yeah, uh, absolutely, and, and I mean, in our reviews, we've both the one this morning presented by James and these here that I presented on, I mean, we looked at all settings, um, both acute, chronic, forced displacement, and so on. But predictably, the evidence is much more from stable settings because that's really where most of the NCD work is taking place. It also is much easier to do research uh, in those settings. And uh, I can't remember if it was brought up this morning or not, but in the, the, the review uh, led by James, I think we only found uh, out of the 80-odd studies that were identified, I think there was one with IDPs. Uh, internally displaced person. So, 
Um, that, you know, there's this definite um, bias towards much more stable uh, settings for very understandable reasons. Um, so I think it's a really important issue that you raise, yeah. Good. Okay, so we might just move on now. So Pablo, who is uh, going to speak first. 